history laid the foundation that informs our conversation. Welcome to the classroom. From the church to the streets. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're so excited for another episode of Fannie Lou's Classroom, and we have an amazing topic on deck for today. But first, you know, we all have to give a shout out to our all female production crew. We have Roche and Brooke once again handling the business on today to make sure we have an amazing podcast. We have our executive producer, Candace, in the house. She's over in the corner, don't want to be seen. And then, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say we have Sister Cheryl with us. She's a guest today, but she's also part of our amazing team. And then Shanika's off in the cut once again uh but she's part of our team so we always want to make sure we give props to those who make this possible listen make sure you like us on instagram like us on facebook we have our facebook group fanny lou's classroom where you can join that group where you can stay updated see what we have going on and know what the next show is going to be about and to talk back to us to let us know what you may want to hear as an episode in fanny lou's classroom and then of course subscribe and like our youtube channel and tell everyone you know about fanny lou's classroom this podcast that is designed really to talk about current issues that impact our lives daily so listen one of the things you know we like to kick off and do is talk about just something that we need to give our attention to something that may be happening in the world something that may be hot topic that we don't want to let pass us by just because we have a set topic for the day and so let's step into fanny's class for just a moment I keep a shotgun in every corner of my bedroom. So if any cracker thinks he's going to throw dynamite on my porch, he'll never write his mama again. These were the words of Fannie Lou Hamer. And she said these words in response to the ongoing white terror that she was able to experience at the hands of the state particularly a beating that she took that was almost unto death, where she had physical limitations as a result of that beating. And as we think about what happened just this past week, what we became aware of this past week as relates to Jalen Wallen, who was, we don't know how many times he was shot at, but we know the coroner is saying he had at least over 60 wounds, 60 gunshots to an unarmed person. He was unarmed, but you have heavily armed and trigger-happy police officer who shot him over 60 times. And so one of the things we want to think about in this moment are the ways in which white terror that visited Fannie Lou Hamer still is with us today. And not only the shooting over 60 times of Jalen, we think about the fact that a Michigan police officer or sheriff had to come clean and say and apologize that in their target practice of the police training, they use images of black men. And so it's no surprise then, right, then we say there's a great disparity in the ways in which white terror visits black bodies in America. When we think about the Highland Park, Illinois shooter who was taken unarmed, then you have the white man who shot three police officers and a canine dog, Unarmed, well, heavily armed, but taken without, well, they roughed him up a little bit, but he's still alive and breathing. And so it really further underscores what Dr. Eddie Claude calls the value gap, that in America we have a human hierarchy and some bodies have more value than others. And so what I really want to say on today as we think about Fannie Lou's class is that we all really have work to do that the inhumane ways in which we are treated is embedded in America. In fact, that America was born in violence and shaped in the iniquity of white terror and white privilege. And we have a responsibility, all of us do, to do our part to radically reimagine public safety and to do what we can to disrupt and dismantle the way policing is done in America because it really impacts our communities more than any others. Not to mention the brother, and I believe, I don't know, someone can help me remember who recently was paralyzed. Um, his back and neck were broken in the back of a paddy wagon. They took him on a rough ride, likened to what they did to Freddie Gray in Baltimore. So I'm just simply saying that we cannot, you know, sit aside that we have this unjust policing system 
And we have to do something individually and collectively to deal with this form of physical violence because this really is evil personified when we see what is happening to continue to happen to black bodies here in America. So I just want us not to let that pass us by and not just to see another hashtag and say that's bad, let's tweet about it, let's talk about it, but what are we really going to do individually and collectively to work towards creating a more just system? Whatever that looks like, we all need to be a part of that movement and do what we can so we can stop just hashtagging being angry in the moment and having episodic wins, right, where the family may get some kind of compensation, but what do we do to make sure this is really systemic and it's really changed? It really calls for a revolution. We really have to do something very significantly different to bring about a change. And so speaking of structural violence, today I want to talk about another topic as it relates to structural violence, and that is health disparity, but particularly what it means in terms of black, black maternal mortality rate. So we want to talk about the ways in which black women disproportionately do not survive childbirth as relates to their counterparts. And we'll talk about black uh, maternal health as well, the importance of that to prevent the mortality rate. But that's, that's what we want to talk about today. And we want to talk about this in light of Roe v. Wade decision. We want to talk about this in light of the ongoing disparities that we see in the outcomes when it comes to black women. And I know many people will say to me, well, a lot of women... Uh, also die in childbirth. Women have issues with health care, and what I want to suggest is that we disproportionately are impacted. And I also would say when black women win, everybody else will be taken care of. Because as Malcolm X said, we are the most unprotected, disrespected, and neglected person in America. So we're always fighting to see what can we do to make this country better, because we know everybody will benefit from that. And so we'll just jump right in. I have two awesome guests on today. Yeah, that's all I have for Fanny's class today, because I don't want to go on a too much of a tangent. But we have to do something about this ongoing assault on black bodies. The physical violence, yes. But we also need to be just as adamant about dealing with the structural violence, because it kills us slower. It kills us slowly. But also, it's more individual, right? I may be at home suffering, and you may not know about it. But collectively, it is killing us all the same. And so my first guest I'm excited to welcome is Dr. Stacy McCormick. And I'm going to read a short bio of hers, and you can get the full bio if you click on the link down in Fannie Lou's classroom. So Dr. Stacy McCormick is a Mississippi-raised black feminist scholar and writer. Okay, she's from the Deep South. Uh, I'm from Memphis. I know about Mississippi. She's from the Deep South. Come on, Fannie Lou Hamer. I see, where, I see the connection here now. Okay. And she is an associate professor of English Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies and Women and Gender Studies at Texas Christian University, that's TCU in Fort Worth, Texas. Her work takes up a number of subjects such as representations of the body, land, sexuality, and the ongoing renaissance of slavery in contemporary black writing and performance. She is the author of Stage in Black Fugitivity. Thank you. Black <laughs> Fugitivity and co-editor of the special issue of College Literature, Toni Morrison, and Adaptation. Currently, she is developing a manuscript on black critical engagement with gynecolo gyneco gynecological and obstetristic. That's not how you say that word. Obstetric. Obstetric. Got it. I knew, it went, I knew that <laughs> wasn't right. See, we're the village. We help each other. That's right. Uh, we help mm -hmm. each other. Um, medicine. She is pursuing the work as a 2021-2022 Mellon ACLS Scholars and Society Fellow in residence with the FIA Center, a reproductive justice organization here in Dallas, Texas. And she is also a member of... Alpha Kappa Alpha on, Sorority sorry. Incorporated. So I'm super excited to have <laughs> Dr. Stacey McCormick with us on today. As you can see, she is well uh, capable and competent to have this conversation with us on today. And then we have our very own Miss Cheryl Prelo. Some of you know her already. She offers more than 25 years of extraordinary success in a series of high-level roles as top-tier companies that include Prism Health North Texas, Dallas County Medical Society, Texas Health Resources, Health Midwest Medical Group, Samuel E. Rogers Community Health Center, Detroit Medical Center, and Trauma Medical Center. Currently, Cheryl is providing strategic and operational consultant services for local nonprofits that address the determinants of health by focusing on social justice and racial equity issues. Cheryl's invaluable experience, expertise in broad 
business range have powered a history of developing successful programs, <clears throat> redesigns, and improvements that provide productivity, reliability, and client satisfaction. Cheryl is a doctoral candidate in public health and holds a Master of Health Administration from the University of Missouri, Columbia, as well as a Bachelor of Arts degree in biology from the University of Missouri, Columbia. As you can see, both of our black women, listen, not only are they degreed up, I can tell you by my interaction with them and working closely with them, they also have a passion for the health of black women, for health care and access to care, and they are a lover of people and justice. So they're more than just their, their paper, right? But we appreciate the paper because we do know there is something to matriculating and getting that information. As they say, education is the one thing no one can ever take away from you. So you all are very capable to have this conversation. So I just want to jump right in. Because obviously this whole, well, oh, let me start here. I'm going to go out of order a little bit. Dr. McCormick, I'm going to come to you first. Because mm -hmm. I want you to root and ground this conversation in the context of Fannie Lou Hamer when we talk about health care disparities and when we talk about the assault and the lack of autonomy that black women have had over their bodies. So just give us a little yes. bit about what you want to say, how you can ground this conversation uh, in light of Fannie Lou Hamer. Yes, so... This is so appropriate to be in Fannie Lou's classroom <laughs> because Fannie Lou Hamer, in addition to her advocacy work, her political work, she was deeply invested in maternal justice, if you will. In 1961, she had a condition of uterine tumors, um, and she went under um, anesthesia, and without her permission, she was given a hysterectomy. And she had full intention to develop a family, to, um, you know, reproduce, even in these difficult times. She wanted that right. And they took it from her. They call this the Mississippi appendectomy, where mm -hmm. black women in particular were systemically um, sterilized without their permission, knowledge, or any type of, you know, um, consent. And so Fannie Lou Hamer spoke out about that. She spoke out about the indignity she suffered as a result of that mm -hmm. and the fact that in a place like Mississippi where black life is devalued um, and including, you know, around the U.S., she felt very central to that struggle as well. So Fannie Lou um, Hamer went on to adopt children. Mm -hmm. um, she created a daycare. And so there are all these ways that she was invested in birth justice um, mm. and maternal justice that uh, often doesn't get raised up in addition to her work. But as we also know, these are all intertwined because her creation of Freedom Farms yes, was about yes. sustainability mm -hmm. and raising people to be able to create their own resources so they don't have to live in poverty. And that's all a part of the reproductive justice landscape. So I think it's highly appropriate that we're here talking in Fannie Lou's classroom about maternal mortality and maternal health. Yes, and thank you for that grounding. And I just and I think it's so important what you just did was connect dots for folks. Because I think when we hear reproductive justice, people automatically go to it's about abortion. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's really about how do we survive Period, right? And Fannie Lou Hamer understood that in terms of, like you said, the pig farm that she created, mm -hmm. getting land, and, and, and her well-developed um, theological orientation to land and labor. Yes. Like she understood what that meant from a standpoint of what it meant to be black and Christian. That's right. And understanding that for her, that was doing God's work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I thank you for bringing that up because I think that's how we have to look at this as a totality. And so now let's, so I'm just going to jump right in because I think this is what I want to talk about. Um, so let me throw this out here. And this could be for either you or Cheryl to, well, Cheryl, you can answer it first because you mentioned mm -hmm. um, maternal mortality. People may not necessarily know what that means. So let's start with what, when we say maternal mortality, what are we saying? So the most um, recognized definition of that is when a mother either dies during childbirth or within one year of giving birth. So that is what we collect data on to determine kind of uh, maternal mortality. And what are some of the things that can attribute to maternal mortality? Okay, yeah. 
we need a whole day to talk about okay. that. But I think, <laughs> give, um, give, give us a number. Somebody can go down a rabbit yes. hole and learn more on yes. their own. Yes. So obviously some of the first things are is just having access to um, health care services. So being insured, being able to find a provider who actually will take your insurance and who will see you. Also, even understanding what it means to that you need to do to prepare your body mm-hmm. to be pregnant. And then when you are, to make sure that you are getting the care that you need and that you have the comfort level and or the assistance to ask questions when things happen. All of the stress that we as black women face every mm-hmm. single day, all of that uh, stress builds up and can lead to bad outcomes from us because our bodies suffer from um, weathering, which is the kind of the, the long exposure of toxic chronic stress that ages our body um, more higher than what our chronological age is. Mm-hmm. So that means that when we have any type of medical emergency or condition that might come up during pregnancy, it may be more advanced just because our body is mm-hmm. older and sicker and not able to actually mm. to respond to whatever treatment or, you know, um, services that, um, that are provided. Housing, you know, am I living somewhere that is safe? I can be comfortable. Again, I don't have to worry about um, being accosted in my home or bullets flying uh, around me. Do I have access to healthy, affordable food? So just all those determinants of health contribute to maternal mortality. And when we think about how we identify solutions to this, we have to take a holistic approach. You can't just uh, focus on a provider or, you know, um, access to health care or food. I mean, it is literally everything that um, encompasses one's ability to live a healthy life. Yes. Yes. Dr. Morton, did you want to add to that? Well, I think um, Cheryl really encapsulated Mm -hmm. um, the major aspects of maternal mortality. I think I would only add that we really need to take into account the foundations of American gynecology and the fact that the origins of American Mm -hmm. gynecology were um, created and developed on the backs of enslaved women who were experimented on, Many uh, people might have heard the names Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy, who were three named enslaved women who J. Marion Sims performed mm-hmm. his operations on without anesthesia or any type of care. Um, and then post that, there were several unnamed enslaved women that continued across this, you know, slaveholding um nation in the slaveocracy that were also experiencing this. So there's a host of unnamed enslaved women who were being experimented on all in the name of gynecology. And what that results is when we think about the foundation of these issues is that these systems were built um, and designed not for our care, but for our exploitation. And so when we often, you know, maternal mortality often occurs when people are exposed more to the healthcare system than less. Mm. And that's a deep irony, right? Right. Um, because you would think that contact with medical systems would actually create better outcomes. But what happens is because patients aren't listened to, because yes. they aren't given the right and dignity of being able to co-partner and co-create their care, mm-hmm. they're often disregarded and mistreated. And then they're, um, issues exacerbate. So, so those are all. It's, it's a whole ecology yeah. Yeah. of um, issues that are created out of this system, and it works in tandem with access to food, access yes. to uh, resources. So, yes, it's it's a very complex and intricate web. Yes. Yeah, and you said so much that makes me want to ask two additional questions. Well, I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to come back to, well, because I might forget because we have so much to talk about. <laughs> so two things you said that brought up two additional. So when you talk about, mm-hmm. you kind of laid this, the landscape and the foundation, right, as to now we're, why we deal with all of the health disparities that Cheryl mentioned. Yes. So also, does this also lend itself to the fact that they think we are biologically different, therefore, 
we don't experience pain. Therefore, that we, you know, what we're saying is happening to us is really not happening to us, making us think we're crazy. So can you talk about also how that's, and that can prevent us from going to the doctor, right? right. So to to your point, we may not go because of that reason. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about that as you said that, because I know a lot, me personally, and I think one of the things you, I realized when you start having these conversations with particularly black women, mm-hmm. we all start telling our stories of That's how right. we have been disregarded, yes. not listened to, or your pain is imaginary, or it's not that bad. Right. Right. And so I think to your point, it's persistent. So my That's question right. is, um, I may be getting ahead, but we'll, we'll circle back around because mm-hmm. I'm asking myself now, so what do we do? do we do right so we have this health care system so how do we create what i would say perhaps alternative care systems Mm -hmm. or how do we do a better job at um, creating um, our own ecosystem to interact with the health care system we do have right so does that mean when i'm going to the doctor do i need to maybe ask cheryl to come with me Mm -hmm. to ask questions i may not know to ask right Mm -hmm. um so yeah any any thoughts on that from either of you I i would like to hear that Cheryl and I are looking at it. Yes. <laughs> I go think, ahead. Yes. I think I could probably just give, because when you were talking, a couple of things came up for me. Um, and one is that race-based medicine is still a reality. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I think we have to do in absence of structural, um, you know, we think about abolition, um, that extends to medicine. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there are so many ways that medical providers are trained in the tradition of yeah. affirming these racial disparities yes, yes. Um, and, and medical kind of um, race-based medicine. So when I think about what we do in that space, we need to really tap into our traditions and the things that our grandmothers mm-hmm. and great-grandmothers did. We need to get a midwife or a doula. That's it. Mm-hmm. We need to have someone who's going to advocate with us and alongside of us. I know when I experienced my pregnancies, I was so scared. I tended to listen more to the doctors mm-hmm. because I just wanted to live through the experience. Wow. And so what I didn't do is harness my own power and my own agency mm-hmm. because I was so believing in that system and that was you know before I realized that that system wasn't necessarily designed for my care yes and when I realized that it was too late and I was in a hospital bed about to have Mm. a stillbirth and so that really does become the first thing we need to do we need to really harness our power Mm -hmm. but I want to raise up um, because in kind of thinking about our conversation I came back to this story is so tragic of Charles and Kira Johnson. Um, And Kira was um, going into labor. She went and uh, delivered her second son in Cedar sinai Hospital. This was in about, I think, 2019. And she didn't come home. Mm -hmm. She died. And her husband has since dedicated his life Mm -hmm. to raising up her legacy. She's a black woman well-appointed, well-educated, but she went into that hospital thinking all would be well. Mm -hmm. They nicked her bladder in the C-section, and she bled out. And when he was saying to the medical professionals, my wife's, her catheter is filling up with blood. I need you all to get on top of this. They looked him in the eye and said, your wife is not a priority right now. And he truly believes, and I agree with him, that her race Mm. and the fact that she was a black woman in that hospital was what impacted them actually helping her. So sometimes, I guess I say this to say, sometimes you can do everything and it still not go your way Mm -hmm. because these Mm. systems are set up so structurally biased that will end up with negative outcomes. And that's a problem for the system. So I think in addition to self-advocacy, we really need to push. um, You know, there's a bill, the Momnibus Bill, and um, other, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about policy issues. Mm -hmm. But we really need to push on people in power to really address um, the ways that black people in particular experience medicine. So... um, I guess that's a place to start uh, in that. Yeah, and I think what you said, one of the things that you said, well, you said a lot of important things, but one of the things I don't want people to miss is that this happens regardless of your education achievements, Mm -hmm. 
your econ- like socioeconomics is out the window. Mm-hmm. It so it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you are a young mother, perhaps who is on WIC, SNAP, or other you know type of state assistance, or if you have a PhD. That's right? right. There, it's your race, and I think to your point, it's so important for us to understand that so that we come together as a collective, and we don't that we don't even look you that we don't buy into the pathology. Yes. Of certain people who may be with child up and against others. That's right. Right. That's right. They were all in this together. And yeah. to your point, I do think because we're talking about systems and institutions. And again, and I'll say this about a lot of our systems and institutions in America. They are rooted, grounded and upheld and undergirded mm-hmm. by white terror and white privilege. That's right. So, right. So I think if that if that's what undergirds it, we have to some kind of way interrogate that and disrupt it. That's right. To that's your point. Right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and yeah, we'll get to policy a little later, but I want to circle back around to, as Cheryl laid out, maternal mortality, what that meant. Let's talk about statistics now. Yes. Because what we know is that black women are most impacted. So can you give us some statistics from maybe U.S., maybe why, what that looks like, and even narrow it down to Texas? Yeah. Go ahead, Cheryl. So um, I think from the, like, the national level, we are, you know, at least three to four times more likely to die during um, childbirth or within that first year. And I know that in the state of Texas, um, as recent as an article that I read from 2021, that African-American women are only 11% of the population. However, we um, account for 31% Mm -hmm. of the maternal deaths in the state of Texas. So that is a that is a huge disproportionate burden on yes. on us as women, and it clearly identifies that the system. And when I say this, I mean the macro system. To your point, is broken, and mm-hmm. it is not designed to make sure that we are healthy and that we live. Because you know you can you can live and not be healthy, right? Um, and then you can you know be healthy and live a, 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 a and and have a good life but we we don't have our systems aren't structured for us to be successful in that way in any shape matter or form so um, those are just some of the statistics that I that I have and and even in covid um before covid i believe it was about 17.2 of per 100,000 live births there was a mortality that was the mortality rate um, and after COVID, it went to almost 23, 24 per 100,000 live births. Are so we talking about black women or women in general? Disproportionately black women, uh, but women in general. Okay. The, the maternal mortality rate rose um, tremendously uh, during COVID. And it's something that the CDC has kind of sounded the alarm on. Mm-hmm. I don't think they've done any, like, steps taking the actual steps but they've released the report and what we do know is that a lot of the outcomes of COVID-19 are still yet to be seen in terms of the impact on people's health Mm -hmm. and we know that you know black people experience these issues at a much higher rate um, than uh, their white counterparts. And so what concerns me as most issues um, that I feel we are most impacted by, that there's no outcry, that right. there's no sounding of the alarm, there's no saying, hey, we have a public health crisis on our hands in the state of Texas, in America, as it relates to the fact that black women are not surviving the moment, right? Yeah. So can you talk to us about uh, how can faith communities be a grounding space for civic engagement to create a space for women to be vulnerable about their experiences that I would think would lend itself to us being able to say what can we do yes yes I think that's such an important question Um, I think it goes back to um, really digging into what gender justice means Mm -hmm. because when we think about black women and their level the level of care and concern um, that people um, you know uh, present toward them or exercise toward them is just so much lower than mm-hmm. any other group, including black men. You know, um, I, I can't help but not raise this up, the Brittany Griner situation yes. mm-hmm. uh-huh. in um, Russia. You know, Brittany Griner has been in prison, in prison unfairly in Russia for months. 
and um, is now facing more time, extensions of trials, and only until now, and this is what really appalled me, when she released a public letter um, saying, I'm in this position and I need help from my government, that was the first time that Joe Biden met with Brittany's wife. And I was really disheartened by that because I was mm. thinking, why did it take this long? And why did it take this public shaming? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing when we think about black women who are also killed by police. Mm -hmm. um, the ways that our issues impact us is deeply embedded in a massage noir. I want to raise up Moya Bailey's term, yes. which is that yes. very specific gender bias that's directed uh, toward black women. That's right. And that we experience in a different way than just regular old misogyny. <laughs> right. That's right. right. That's right. And so the church needs to be the place because it is, I was, I was talking to someone about sex education and we, you know, we were all kind of sitting with, where did we first learn about sex? Where do we first hear about it? Mm -hmm. And often we heard about it in church. What, what, that we weren't supposed to be talking about. Right, it you, you heard about it like in the corner. You didn't hear you from the pulpit in, in your Sunday school class. That's yeah. right, that's right. right. <laughs> but what what happens is in church spaces and, and the conversations about our bodies, our well-being, are bound up in the ways that we come of age in, you know, the tradition of, you know. Um, and, and so we really have a responsibility mm -hmm. to attend to the most vulnerable and black girls and women are yes. the most vulnerable in this conversation. So the church can do a whole lot. Um, and I'll just kind of, you know, say one of the biggest things I love for this church to even do is to root out shame. Um, because a lot of the reasons why people don't seek um, c conversations and help is because they feel shame to even talk about this. Right. Um, but the church should be a space of safety mm -hmm. and a space of care. Um, and we really need to commit ourselves to doing that and making sure that children, because these conversations start early, um, it makes sure that they know that their bodies are valuable right. and that they have a right to um, demand things for their care um, and that people care about them. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think um, we have an enormous responsibility. And I say we, I'm talking about the church with a capital C. Mm -hmm. Um, to really loose the body, if you will. Yes. Right? So, because everybody's talking about it and doing it, but we don't want to talk about it from the pulpit and the Sunday school and other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Which leaves us, in my opinion, exposed mm -hmm. to the system. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wherein, if we talked about it head on and did it in a healthy way, we could then have, I think, more success. If it's not dismantling, disrupting systems and, and creating new systems, mm -hmm. I think it would take us further if we were able to have those conversations yes. very real way yes. in a very healthy way, right? Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that, and I think you're so right. I think it's a challenge to all faith communities because yeah. uh, guess who make up most faith communities? Black women and black girls. Yes. That's yes. right. Yes. Right? So how can you not talk about And I think it goes back to the way in which we have this dualistic theology, right, where we separate the body from the soul. So then we're not going to talk about, your right. body, you know, all these woman issues. Right. That relates to the black woman's body, right? right? We're just going to talk about, the, you know, how to get your soul saved, conversion and instruction. Mm -hmm. We'll worry about the rest of this later, and that'll work itself out. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we can no longer do that. And historically, the prophetic black church is what I'm speaking right. of now, dealt with that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That we believe in body and soul. That's right. That God cares about what impacts us between Sundays, that's uh, right. to use Marla Frederick, yes. Dr. Marla Frederick's terminology. So thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, I think that's so important to say. And just real quickly going back, circling back around to uh, Brittany Griner, why is she in Russia? Because of pay equity. That's yes. right. You yes. see what I'm saying? Yes. So, I mean, uh, and it yes. just continues to show the intersectionality yes. of all of this going back to what Cheryl is talking about in terms mm -hmm. of these determinants of health. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why she, she's been up. That wasn't her first time there. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, so thank you for that. So, Cheryl, in light of the church, um, the challenge from Dr. McCormick for the church to be more engaged and involved, mm -hmm. to have these very open and um, honest conversations Talk to about what are some evidence-based interventions and activities um, that address African-American maternal mortality rate that's something the church will be able to lean into as resources okay. to be able to have the conversation. 
So um, one of the things that Dr. McCormick mentioned was um, doulas. So, uh, and I, I just have a, um, I had a friend who actually had the, the privilege of um, being able to um, use a doula through her process. Um, and just as an example, or for clarification, you know, well-educated, highly positioned in an organization, great health insurance. That's how she was able to access her doula. But the um, studies have shown, though, that doulas or uh, midwives or even if you have like a community health worker type individual that is there to assist the mother throughout her pregnancy and right after is, is very, very helpful. They mm -hmm. can help in a couple of ways. One, they help her to identify um, questions that should be discussed during her prenatal visits. Because she may not know all the things that she needs to ask. So those individuals can help her to, to do that. They can also, if she is very, um, if she feels like she's not being listened to, you know, you have another individual that has some letters behind their names that could probably mm -hmm. help, you know, position her in a better way for that provider to actually listen to what she is saying is, that she's experiencing throughout that pregnancy. They are there to help even afterwards, just, you know, getting you prepared when you get home, being able to be there for a few visits um, afterwards to get you set up, just to know that you have a resource um, um, to go to. So I think that is one thing. The other thing that is really huge and really requires um, a lot of time and energy and effort as most things that are worth doing um, are is we have to begin to really look at developing um, policies that include total health. As I mentioned earlier, you know, your environment, education, housing, access to health care. And I think once we're able to do that, that will, you know, that can also help to address any issues, concerns, identify whatever help the mother may need and make sure that she has access to um, those resources. And then, I mean, this is a policy, but it's still an evidence-based um, activity that we know happens. If we would just um, expand Medicaid coverage to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to provide this um, kind of post-mortem health, um, access to health care, that would just be monumental. So Texas was uh, one of many states that only allowed two additional months after giving birth. They had um, submitted a bill, um, which is what most people, most experts say that, you know, women need at least one mm -hmm. year of additional access to health care services because so many things can, uh, can kind of um, materialize during pregnancy or right after that take months to, mm -hmm. to address. So Texas did look at that, expanding that, um, that coverage for mothers. The request in the bill was for 12 months. It's six months, which is better than two months. But we definitely need to make sure that once a mother gives birth, she there's no gap in health care. I mean, just like that baby. That baby is born, and, you know, if you don't have insurance, mm -hmm. and they're going to, you know, you're going to be able to get them on Medicaid. So there's no gap in in health um, care insurance and access to care for them. So I think those are things that um, are some examples mm -hmm. of things that we can do to really address that. And, I, and then there are like individual things that, in, that people can do. We talked about that earlier, just making sure that you do have someone, if it's not a doula, uh, community health worker or, or whatever, um, that you have someone that's walking through this journey with you. Um, the other thing that we have found um, that is, is very helpful, and we hit on this, is, you know, addressing bias, unconscious or not, and, and, and providers and their entire team. So it's not just, you know, someone who's an MD or RN, you know, it's, it could be that entire mm -hmm. staff. Um, that you come into contact with and making sure that we are really doing things to kind of break those down just from, you know, your practice standpoint and then within the, the hospital system itself. And I'll just give a quick example. I know I'm digressing. So I'm going to share a little bit of my story. When I had my, um, my girls, they're now 15. 
uh, I was fortunate enough. I had I had a wonderful doctor. She looked just like me, and that was one thing that I was bound and determined to to make sure that I had that. So she was great. I, my hospital stay was not that great. I had a lot that went on during um, the delivery process, and um, as a result of that, I was not as healthy and able to do things for my for myself. And even though I requested assistance just to kind of do some of the basic things you need to do to get through the day, I did not get that help. Mm-hmm. You know, we need you to get up and we need you to, I said, mm-hmm. but I, I don't feel I can do that and, and do it safely. Mm-hmm. So my husband at the time had to help me because I, I, just, I just couldn't get the help from the, um, from the team. And to get back to a statement I made earlier about stress and how mm-hmm. uh, we are getting that from all avenues throughout our lives as African-American women, again, I had a harder time because of a lot of things that happened, so I needed more time. My girls were in a NICU um, for a few days um, just because they were, you know, really little and all that stuff, and they needed to maintain their body warmth. So they were ready to kind of be released from the NICU. I was still having problems. I mean, we were in a hospital because I was having problems. And I was very healthy mm-hmm. and worked out and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But I got a call at, I don't know, I'm going to say 10 o'clock. I have no idea. It was nighttime. I received a call saying, uh, Miss Prelo, your babies are ready to, um, your insurance has met the limit and your babies need to be released from the NICU. And if we don't do that, you're going to be charged $2,000 a day for the girls to stay in there. This is what I got while I'm in the hospital trying to yeah. recover, just having a baby. So, so just an example of kind of stress and, mm-hmm. and just the lack of compassion from the team. And I don't know if they had to do with what I looked like, but I just felt like that was a very inappropriate thing to call and tell a mother in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to bring your babies down to you or you're going to be charged $2,000 a day if your babies stay in the NICU. So, again, just kind of really looking at how to address the kind of the processes and kind of the, you know, the biases or just unfortunate things that we have uh, as part of the process that kind of lead to these bad outcomes for African-American women. Mm. And I think what you're speaking to, too, is um, a shift once medical technology, again, reinforcing mm. this idea that the more contact we have medicine doesn't necessarily mean it's great, Um, is that once um, there was a development of being able to observe the fetus in utero, to being able to, you know, do all these things, the attention kind of started focusing on the baby and not the mother. Um, Mm -hmm. And so often now, once the babies are okay, who cares about what happens to the mother? Yeah. Wow. Um, and, and that's why a lot of people, including um, the birth justice team at the AFIA Center, they advocate for the fourth trimester. Yes. Uh, because mm. they talk about how you, your journey only begins health-wise once you deliver. It's not the end of something. Yes. And so you were needing that fourth trimester yes. care. And no one was really interested in giving it to you. No one. And that's, you know, and, and not just... Uh, physical care, but mental health care, yes, right, because that also plays a big right. role in our own the weathering and mm-hmm. all of that. Um, because that's a, a mental, you know, I I had uh, preeclampsia, um, and so I delivered my daughter early. And um, one of the things I read about was that Black women experience preeclampsia at much higher rates because it deals with high blood pressure and stress. Yes. Mm. And and so when you are experiencing life as a black woman, yes. you're already contending with a lot. And then yes. your pregnancy also amps up that experience. So I, it made so much sense once I saw it in writing. Mm. But I think, um, you know, those are the issues that we also have to be mindful of. Mm-hmm. So I'm also mm-hmm. hearing, I think Cheryl mentioned this earlier, and this is really coming back around, is that if we're thinking about starting a family as a black woman, that we have to even, like, we can't even enjoy the luxury, like, oh, let's start a family. I may have to think about what stressors do I need to attend to? Yes. yes. What are some real systems I have to put in place to yes. have the necessary support that I need to even yes. go through yes. con- conception, carrying, birthing, fourth trimester? So now yes. it's like even us wanting to have a family yes, yes. has to be um, well thought out. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
we don't have the luxury of just living life and let's just have this beautiful family, this white picket fence. Mm-hmm. And so with that being the case, so you mentioned the AFIA Center, because I also want to lift that up, because they're doing amazing, important work here in the city yes. of Dallas. And I think it, talk, it at least gives a, another way of us being able to address maternal mortality, right, right, and access to um, health care. So talk to us a little bit about what you're doing with the AFIA Center mm-hmm. uh, as it relates to this particular issue. Yes, so the AFIA Center and I came together as a part of a project that um, I was felt that we needed, which is a storytelling uh, project to shift the narrative. Mm-hmm. Because the narrative around these issues is always centered on mother blame. Mm-hmm. Whenever a black woman experiences a negative outcome, or even women in general, birthing people who go into the hospital and have negative outcomes regarding their pregnancies, they are often blamed. They'll say, okay, well, mm-hmm. you were obese or you didn't have a healthy diet, or maybe you smoked. Mm -hmm. All of these things, it's to say nothing of what the medical system's responsibilities are. Um, And so I really felt like that was insufficient, especially here in Texas, when we have such high rates um, of mortality. So we came together to tell stories Mm -hmm. um, and talk to people about their experiences. And we sought out people stories that weren't getting the coverage, you know, as much as I love um, the, uh, how much Charles Johnson is advocating for his wife, Kira, there are people who are um, under-resourced yes. um, and who also have other um, stigmatizing issues, people who've experienced incarceration, mm-hmm. people who are dealing with HIV AIDS, mm-hmm. um, who are also having children. And so we wanted to give this holistic picture. And so we came w- with the Livable Black Futures initiative that is a storytelling project that is attempting to speak back to these health structures that are really um, trying to shape the narrative in their own way for their own benefit. Um, and so when it comes to what we can do, too, is we have to speak out because a lot of times we go home and internalize our experiences mm-hmm. as our fault. And then we don't share our stories. Mm-hmm. It took me a long time to talk about what happened to me. I experienced stillbirth um, in one pregnancy, then um, preterm labor at 26 weeks with my daughter. I finally had one uneventful pregnancy, but it was still kind of mired in all this um, history and experience. But I felt like it was something that I was dealing with alone because it was hard to find outlets. And so that was something that I also felt when I think about my own healing journey, I knew that healing had to happen in community. Mm -hmm. We can't, we don't heal alone, right? And so that's been a principle for me. And that's why I also think the church is so valuable because churches have such a capacity to be healing spaces. And there are a lot of people in our congregations or in our communities that are dealing with internalized pain that they think is their fault and they won't come forward because they feel that they have, you know, some responsibility or some shame. So the AFIA Center, in addition to all the host of the advocacy work they do, that's our primary um, work in that space. And I've it's been such a um, edifying and, and a healing experience for me, and I'm so thankful uh, to have had that experience with them. And I think, and that's why I want you to talk about the AFIA Center, because we don't have a lot of places yeah. like that that mm-hmm. really center the narrative, story, and lives of black women. Mm-hmm. And I thought about, and I had to, to look it up to make sure I had the right state. I knew it was a senator, a state senator, but the Louisiana state senator who even talked about when he made the statement, oh, our yes. maternal mortality rate is not that bad if we you don't, don't include, include black, black women. women. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> you, 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 so, again, right? Um, it's like, for real? It's the, era- <laughs> it, it's the erasure, right, yes. uh, that our lives really don't matter. Yes. And I just... But we can think about a lot of the ways in which a lot of burden we carry. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, again, going back to Cheryl's point that we don't, sometimes we don't even know yeah. we're carrying. Yeah. Until she unpacked them, like, I didn't even think about how that impacts your ability to one conceive, mm-hmm. to carry, to birth, and mm-hmm. post, you know, birth, yes. what that means. And I'm like, gosh, you know, and, and that's why I think the Affiliate Center is so important, and I think people should support the Affiliate Center. Yeah. Um, because it's not just about a woman's right to choose whether to, to bring life into this world, but it's about the totality of our survival, a place to feel vulnerable, safe, to tell our stories. Right. And to your point, 
we our churches should be those places of healing as well, right? Yes. I firmly believe that we have to get back to be in places not just where justice, peace, and love and liberation can be that, but the healing That's right. has to take place. Mm-hmm. And so you meant, so talk to us just a little bit about um, when churches do this. What's the the point of departure? What point of departure should be used to really to how we can talk about the black woman's body in the church? Yeah, because I think we don't have the language and we don't even know where to start. Because mm-hmm. theologically, as it relates to women in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Right, we have the woman at the well who couldn't keep a husband. That's the narrative. Yeah, but that's not what was going on at the well. Right. right? So Missy Smith does a great job unpacking this mm-hmm. and really recovering the story of that Northeast African woman. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. that she was not like this woman who had a thousand husbands and she wasn't coming on to Jesus. Like, right. So it's so much as it relates to the black body, black women, a black woman's body that's so wrapped up theologically. Yeah, that's not healthy. In yes. the whole, and quite frankly, a bad hermeneutic. But anyway, we'll, that's another conversation. <laughs> but just talk yes. to us about, though, I mean, where do we start when you have start? churches who may have that view of the black body? Yes, I'm, I definitely want to respond to that. And I also wanted to raise up that the Afia Center is addressing the doula situation by providing doula care for people who cannot afford it Mm. and are under-resourced. I'm so glad you raised that up, Cheryl, because a lot of the perception is that you need a doula if you you can get a doula if you have funds, Mm. and usually it's inaccessible, and that's been a big Mm. part of their effort to say, no, everybody deserves this. Um, And so when it comes, though, to the the body and the church, and this topic is is really close to my heart because having grown up in church and experienced a lot of body shame, Mm -hmm. um, I really did struggle to feel comfortable in my own body and to even tell people what was happening to me because I felt so much shame around my body. Mm. Um, And so, you know, I would be pulled to the side and say, you know, you need to wear something different next Sunday. Mm. Um, Or I would be told, you know, you don't want to tempt men or things like that, that there's this way (laughs) that, and I was a girl. I was not even a a teenager at the time. And I was told these things and Mm. I'm thinking, what man is looking at a child? (laughs) Um, But then pedophile. Right. (laughs) Thank you. But that's the that's the conversation you should be having, not telling a young girl. Yeah. Don't tempt these men. But nevertheless, I meant to go ahead. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's like uh, the urge, um, the start origins of victim blaming that start right there at those young ages where we teach children that somehow they're responsible for other people's actions. That's right. And so I think the first thing the church has to do is to really step into bodily autonomy. And that can mean everything um, from a child who's a toddler who sees an adult and they see him after church and they want to hug him. And that toddler says, uh-uh, I don't know that person. I don't want to hug. And usually the, they have to be forced to because that's polite. Mm-hmm. But what that's teaching that child mm-hmm. is that an older person can take over your mm-hmm. own bodily boundaries mm-hmm. because of social convention. Yes. And that's minor, but what it but what it does is it's a conditioning. Yes. That our bodies are not our own. Which makes it major down the road. Makes yes. it major down the road. And 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 that that continues. And so, you know, your bodily boundaries, your your um ability to determine your own destiny mm-hmm. is often um, you know, usurped by people who feel like they know better than you. And the church really has a position to kind of stand in that and say, no, 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 Mm -hmm. your body is your body. Mm -hmm. And how you experience your life in your body matters. And we don't get to dictate that for you. Right. People need to kind of get out of people's business (laughs) and let people determine their own, you know, path. Um, And that's a big step. But that's, that's key because when I think about reproductive justice, Bodily autonomy is at the center of that. That's right. And um, so so that's where I would say the start has to come. And then after we kind of establish that bodily autonomy philosophy is that we need to then see how we can support people in um, enacting that. What can we yes. do uh, for sexual reproductive health, um, whether it's providing information, resources? Um, do we have, you know, support for girls who are on their periods? 
Mm-hmm. Um, do we have support for um, young people who are kind of being exposed to sexual topics at an earlier and earlier right. age? Is there a safe space in this, you know, place for them to come talk? What if somebody touched them in a way that makes them uncomfortable and they don't have anywhere to talk about that but the church? Mm-hmm. Can we give that space to people? Because that's also bodily autonomy. You, you, you know, experience that. So that's, I think, so important. Um, and if we really just lean into that, we would be going a long way. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you. So uh, did you want to add something? Actually, I wanted to add something, but not for that comment, the comment around the, the do was when yeah. you were asking also about um, kind of interventions or policies mm-hmm. that can really help with um, maternal health. You know, there have been a, a handful of states that um, through Medicaid, they have actually covered, mm-hmm. you know, they were reimbursed for doula services. And I, I think that from a, a policy standpoint, we need to look at um, – reimbursement um, structures for yes. these other kind of non-traditional, mm-hmm. non-kind of like pro- traditional provider roles that assist women mm-hmm. through this entire process. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just I just wanted to, no, that's to, to point that, that out. That is big. Because, that's but I think important. it's great that, that the AFIA Center will do it at no cost. But we really need, because, because again, to me, that points to how, that service and the people who are being um, um, cared for are valued. Yes. Now, if I, you know, if I'm valued enough to a livable wage to come in and do whatever my job is, mm-hmm. then I should be valued mm-hmm. enough that when I need access to health care services, social services, mental um, um, mental health services during this whole kind of um, pregnancy um, journey, then there needs to be a way to to pay for that so that no one is is without and that there are more um, organizations, either health systems or um, our social service agencies or um, kind of community-based organizations, which is what I would say the AFI yeah. Center is, that they have a way to actually provide this and get it to the people who need it the most. Right. And can so. we even talk about advocacy for medical reparations? Yes. Because when we think about reparations, that conversation gets a little tricky, but we have a whole lot of need around medical uh, redress for in sure. black communities. And um, Monica McLemore, I really, t- um, she's a nurse and a major um, voice in uh, this these issues, talks about it. Um, but I just want to also tag on that, you know, when it comes to um, even restoring doulas and midwives back into it, they have been pushed out in Mm -hmm. medical. Like, we used to use midwives and give births in homes, Mm -hmm. and now home births in many states are uh, criminalized. Mm. Wow. Many states, you can't have a home birth. Um, In many states... Um, you cannot have a midwife on hand or they have pushed them out and delegitimized them medically. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a whole host of stigma even around mm-hmm. pursuing alternative uh, forms of care. Which mm-hmm. circles back around to extreme capitalism because that's, that's what right. that's about. That's right. Which is another conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's all related. But it's, it's, it's all, all, I mean, all, all the intersections are undeniable. Yeah, the intersections are undeniable, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that's so important. So thank you for sharing that at, in regards to what the church can do, what could be that point of departure. Because even our churches need to be healthier. Yes. As it relates to how we understand the black body, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. Because we just have centuries Right. of what it has meant not to have agency over our bodies. Yes. And I think that has followed us, even though the chains have fallen off. Mm-hmm. Um, we still, like, psychologically, we really still wrestle with that in many ways, and we have um, internalized that yes. in a way that we continue to be harmful. Uh, go ahead. And to each I, Yeah, other. and I just think about, because um, I, I feel so that it's so important to to kind of help people practice radical self-love yes Yes. when we talk about the love of christ when we talk about the ways that we are loved often we don't shift that language to ourselves but radical self-love means accepting yourself at any any stage Mm -hmm. and any size so even this so i i i mean i I just want to highlight these small it's like these little um you know they call them microaggressions i guess you would say Mm -hmm. like the toddler hugging the adult but what about when you comment on somebody's body Oh, you gained weight. Oh, you lost weight. 
It's like automatically what you mm-hmm. are doing is advancing a kind of what we would could think of as fat phobia or some other type of um, bodily conditioning and, and view mm-hmm. that says that only certain kind of bodies right. should be elevated. That's right. And mm-hmm. that anytime your body changes in a way that's not socially desirable shifts. That is another issue around bodily autonomy, actually. Yes. Because what it does is it makes people feel like they're beholden to the world in terms of how they're presenting their bodies. So I think we also have to get out of that, too, commenting on people's, you know, bodies, commenting on their yes. um, appearance. Um, those things are, are really harmful, and they and they don't they seem benign, but they can really be harmful. Oh, I think they are, and I think we, well, I'm going to say this, and then we'll move on. Okay. <laughs> but I think it, it lends itself to this whole build a body. Yes. Right? Um, that if it doesn't look this particular way. That's right. Then you're not designed. And I don't know what I was watching. Um, Oh, it was American Gangster. It was like the Trap Queens. Ah. Uh, And so one episode, though, she was known as the Silicon Queen. Mm. Like she was doing injections all around the country, right? And they talked about the way in which that really elevated, I guess it was the late 90s when videos were out, and something about the fascination of a big butt began to happen and how Mm -hmm. everyday women, then not just video, but everyday women began to say, oh, well, I want silicone injections too, but this all goes down to back to like this fascination of the body and who is saying what's acceptable and what's beautiful. Right. And then obviously with the way social media, I mean, that train has left the station. Right. So Mm -hmm. now it's, um, what do we do about this? So I think Mm -hmm. that's also a conversation we have to have because all this lends itself to what we're talking about as it relates to maternal health care and maternal mortality rate. None of this is disconnected. Mm -hmm. Uh, and disassociated. So we're going to wind up this part of Family's Classroom. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Stacy. You all have had uh, invaluable information to share. We could talk about this for the next three weeks because yes, yeah. it's so <laughs> critical and important. And we'll come back and have more conversation around this as the 88th Texas legislator kicks off. Yes, right. Because there will be quite a bit of legislation around maternal health care and mortality rate, particularly for black women and in general. Mm -hmm. So we'll be back to talk about how we can impact policy and laws. And Cheryl gave me an idea of something we need to talk about in terms of a a, a law that we may want to introduce around doula care. Mm -hmm. Right. So because we're not at tables. That's the other thing I want to talk about. So we talk about mm-hmm. how do we change these systems. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just happen in rallies and marches. Somewhere you got to be behind a table. You have to yes. be somewhere saying, write this, right. use this language, right. push yes. this forward, get this through committee. Like there's still a political process at play. It ain't the best, but it's what we have. Mm-hmm. And it's how do we put ourselves in position to be engaged in that system beyond presidential election year, yes. beyond mm-hmm. midterms. But this is long distance, right? This is right. a marathon, not a sprint, right? right. And so because what, what we're talking about, we're talking about this happened from enslavement. Mm-hmm. to So we're talking 500 centuries at least. Right. You no, know, 400 plus enslavement. Then you got Jim Crow segregation. That's then right. you have what we have now, whatever you want to call it, reinvented, uh-huh. Jim Crow Neo reinvented, slavery. you know, uh, yeah. a reinvention of it. Uh, That's right. But you, so it's, it's, it takes time, right? Yes. I think about Roe v. Wade. You're talking about 60 years they look to overturn that, right? Yeah, right. Like That's right. It, that case, they're like, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep. Mm-hmm. So we have to understand it's, it's always chess, never checkers. That's right. So I think uh, what you all have lifted up has been important. We have to talk about it. And as black women, we're going to talk about it. But it's also, we're looking at black men, where are you? Hey. Uh, because, that's I right. mean, if, do, don't you want us to survive the moment? That's right. Right? Um, mm-hmm. that it, you know, so how valuable are we to ourselves mm-hmm. in our that's community? Right. So I think we have to raise, I don't know if people even know, though, right? Mm-hmm. So it's also how do we become more aware of what the issue is, yes. why it's an issue, and what power, because we have agency and power to make a difference, yes. right? So whether that's the something like the AFIA Center that can deal with that immediate, more concentrated need, Mm-hmm. to how we have to do policy because that impacts thousands yes. as opposed to maybe the few that come through my door, right? right? So I think it's all of it, right? It's, right. The, it's the one-on-one, but it's also we got to deal with this structure that is clearly broken. And we have to, to your point, what is the counter-narrative yes. that we have to begin to tell and say it just as loudly 
That's right. As yes. others are saying, what makes us seem that we're not as valuable, yes. we're not a priority. Yes. Like, how, how do we shape um, that narrative as well and use our resources and platforms that we do have mm-hmm. to do that? Because one thing social media has done is somewhat level that playing field where we can at least get the word right. out there mm-hmm. uh, and to be able to talk about it. So thank you all so much for this part of our se- this segment of Fain Lou's Classroom. So we're going to give it up for Cheryl and Dr. Stacy. <laughs> So now, so what we tend to do now, you know, I always like to say we're more than our professions, our Ah. vocations, (laughs) that we are well-rounded individuals. And I just like to kind of then say, oh, you know, what makes you happy? What brings you joy? What do we need to know about you that nobody knows? A fun fact, you know, just want to learn more about you as a person because you already dropped all your knowledge as a professional. We just want to know who (laughs) you are as a person. Mm -hmm. Ooh, well, shoot. I have a lot of things (laughs) I've been uh, uh, interested in. but I would say we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, just um, pop culture and Beyonce. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and, and I do, I really like the uh, the Break My Soul song only because um, we've been kind of thinking through, like, what does it mean that people are getting all this freedom after the pandemic to, like, just quit? <laughs> Jobs, yes, a great resignation, great resignation mm-hmm. right? So, I love it when I can like get my pop culture and my like social <laughs> commentary in the same place, yes. And uh, so because you know, when she was like, We back outside and we wearing a mask outside, in case y'all don't know how we act outside, I was like, Okay, you're telling people to mask up. <laughs> so, it was like this really interesting moment. So, I love stuff like that. Okay, um, I just finished uh, the Stranger Things marathon with my kids, oh, okay. Um, and uh, you know, I can't believe they got me to watch that stuff because I'd be <laughs> like okay I can have that but it, it was really interesting too because I'm an 80s baby and so okay. I go back to um, that period of time and they really took me back uh, I saw some references to E.T. and yes, uh, yes, all my yes, little movies yes. I was like look at this and, and my kids too uh, my daughter she was singing New Edition the other day and I was like where you learn that song because <laughs> right. New Edition ain't had no song right. on the radio right. unless I'm listening to one old you know seven or 105.7 so um but she's learning these songs on tiktok so we um and and now i'm into like getting on tiktok with her and watching what she watches she can't post i told Mm -hmm. her that's off limits but she can watch and so uh we'll come up with skits and we'll do the same skits it's hilarious oh god so that's 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 kind of been giving me joy yeah and um kind of escaping uh all the reading i do all the time Mm -hmm. Um, and, and balancing out, because I, I was a bookworm for a while. I looked up, and I felt like a whole decade had passed. I was like, what what's, the, what's going on? <laughs> oh, what, is, what are y'all doing? What is this? What is this outfit? Or So, yeah, I needed to, to stop that and make sure I was engaging in the world. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'm always curious to ask this question, Just and this is both for you and Cheryl, for black women. So what is the one thing you do as a form of self-care? Mm. You know what I do? I... Um, I go and have a long time. I have to do resets. So one thing that I've started to do is about every quarter, I have a personal retreat and I'll go get a massage and I'll stay in a hotel. My family understands mom needs that retreat. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll go reset. And I think a lot of times self-care is often being aware of your um, limits because we, as black women, get pulled on so much. Yes. So I will have that reset. So I, I'll sometimes do a Sunday reset, and then I'll do my quarterlies um, so that I'm always getting back in touch with myself and having a long time for a spiritual practice, reconnecting, um, and things like that, and resting. Yes. Taking lots of naps. naps. <laughs> the nap ministry. That's right. <laughs> exactly. The nap ministry is one of my biggest. Uh, that uh, Trisha Hurth- yes. Percy's coming out with a book called "Rest Is Resistance." Everybody should pick that up. Oh, I'm gonna get that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's my care. I think. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. What about you, Cheryl? So, a couple of things. I think one, I love to work out. So that's one thing that I do. Um, I don't. I'm not as fanatical as I was when I was much younger, but. Um, that is something that I enjoy doing. And I think the other thing that I have learned over this um, journey through COVID and other things that are going on is that it's, you know, it's okay that my journey is different Mm. from everyone else's uh, because I am unique and I know exactly what I have and could bring to the table and I know exactly what I 
uh, what I feel God is calling me to do, and that and that and that is what I'm going to focus on. So I think one of the biggest things that has helped me, and I de- and I define this as self care for me, is that I just affirm in myself every day that what I am doing and where I am at is exactly where God wants me to be. And it doesn't matter what someone else thinks about what this might mean for my career on the other side of, uh, of, of this journey. I just know that I need to stay focused and do the things that um, bring me peace and allow me to actually, I think, hopefully, and you can affirm this, utilize <laughs> my, um, my, my talents and gifts that I feel that have been bestowed um, upon me. So th- that's, that's what I do. So I'll answer in the affirmative, absolutely. Um, Cheryl's gifts and talents have done uh, an enormous um, thing here at Friendship West, particularly in the justice ministry, just helping put a little more structure around it uh, and just putting some strategies and systems in place because justice work is indeed uh, a haul. And it needs to be um, planned and organized in a way. For me, and she knows I'm big on this, is how do we create institutional memory, right? How do you build institutions to survive you? Yep. That it can't yep. just be about a person. Yes. And I think that's how going back to this conversation we're having today, you know, the folks who started the inequities are not here, but they persist nevertheless. Yes. And it's what Walter Wink would call a domination system. Mm. Right. It is it's it's um principalities and powers. Mm-hmm. And it's become a, the system itself has become functional in the organism and it's in it's active and alive. And how do we identify that? and deal with those issues. So, um, yes, you do. That's the way of going. Let me not get, cause I, they know I'll get off on a tangent. <laughs> if I talk. So yes, absolutely. She is, she is a gift uh, to the body she of Christ. Is. And so that's yes. an amazing place to end on a note to end mm-hmm. on. Look, thank you for joining this week, Spain Loose Classroom. I hope that something was said that makes you, un- to, that you're more informed around when you hear the words reproductive justice, when you hear the words maternal health care, when you hear the words, maternal mortality rate, you understand what that means and understands what it means in particular for black women and what we can do as individuals and collectively to deal with this great, great vast injustice that's done as it relates to structural violence that is imposed upon the bodies of black women. We look forward to seeing you here on next week, every Thursday, 12 o'clock central time. Join us. Well, join like us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, Join YouTube, subscribe to YouTube, follow us on YouTube. My exec producer is doing something I see her in my peripheral. Their info, their info. And yes, ah. how can, Dr. Stacy, mm-hmm. how can we find you? So you can find me at TCU. I'm going back into the classroom. <laughs> so any prospective college students, if you want to come, I'm going to be teaching a reproductive justice course in yes. the spring. Um, but I also am on Twitter, uh, underscore Dr. Stacy underscore. Um, and I will admit, I'm not as active on social media, but I will respond to a DM. So if you need to slide in and be like, hey, I know, I don't respond to all the DMs, just the yes, ones that right, are like right, right. Up above board. Oh, we um, know. Yes. <laughs> Those DMs are interesting exactly. places, aren't they? <laughs> they are. They are. They are. So, um, so, um, and then also, I just wanted to big up the July 9th is going to be the Reproductive Liberation March in Dallas. Um, and I think okay. that's an important place for us to support because when they talk about reproductive liberation, they're talking about all the things we just talked about in this conversation. And so there's a real way for people to get engaged um, soon, but also there'll be more um, ways, but that they have resources there. They have a lot of um, really uh, great community members that folks can connect to from politicians mm. to birth workers, um, as well as faith people. So I think that we need to to always kind of get out there. So I want to big that up, too. And the AFIA Center, they're on Instagram as the AFIA Center, yes. uh, as well as Facebook and Twitter. I believe it's the AFIA Center um, that is there. But I'll, of course, uh, share now, that. Now, when is this March? This Saturday? This Saturday. Mm-hmm. We didn't know about it. Ah, uh, yes, it's this Saturday. So where is it going to be? What time? Um, I need to uh, – the details are um, – out there, uh, but I don't have them right off the top of my head. I know it's going to be in downtown Dallas, um, okay. and I believe the time is 9 to 11. 
Um, so it usually, you know, there'll be people giving speeches and then yes. they're going to do a march. Okay. Um, so I will be happy though to for that. Send along. that to us and we'll, mm-hmm. make, we'll add it to the YouTube um, yes. channel for this episode. So mm-hmm. folks can come back and, and grab that and find that. We'll also put it on our Instagram and our Facebook page so people can find that. Cause that's yes. important to know because mm-hmm. we weren't aware. Uh-huh. Um, we certainly would have done what we can to push and support that. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Sure. Where can we find you? <laughs> <laughs> So for those who know me know that I do not participate in the <laughs> social media <laughs> things that are out there. But I am on LinkedIn. So okay. you can find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> Sorry, that's the best I can well, do. You have an email. They want to shoot you an email and talk to you and ask you to come speak to their group. How can we reach okay, you? Okay, well way? I I guess I can share my email. It's my name, Cheryl Prelo at live.com. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You have too much to offer for not, people not to be able to reach yeah. you. <laughs> so, again, thank you for joining this uh, week's episode. Again, like us on Instagram, join our Facebook group, and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and tell everyone you know about Fannie Lou's Classroom. We look forward to seeing you here next week, Thursday, 12 o'clock Central Time. From the church house.